So now that we've seen the basics of geometrical optics, we will continue with a very important but slightly intricate principle called Fermat's principle. So to explain Fermat's principle, it's useful to first look at a sentence that Heron of Alexandria once said that says, light takes the shortest, shortest path. And that, of course, can explain reflection. However, there was Pierre de Fermat who then made this more precise by stating that light travels the path between two given points which requires the shortest time relative to the neighboring path. So time means the time of propagation that light takes. So let's look at this a little bit in more in detail and how we can use it to explain optical phenomena with it. It can actually explain reflection and refraction at the same time, given that light travels slower in an optically dense medium. Uh, this is a picture of Pierre de Fermat. So this is, this is a, a graphical picture that shows you uh, what is meant by that statement. It means out of all the possible ways, so if light could travel this way and this way and this way, it takes the shortest path. And of course, in a homogeneous medium, that would simply mean connect the two points here by a straight line. And that sort of explains why light seems to travel along straight line. And of course, that forms the basis of geometrical optics. So light always follows an extreme path, either, either one that minimizes the time taken or one that maximizes it. So there's a mathematical version of Fermat's principle, which is based on variational calculus. For those who know how this works, you would calculate the first variation of the optical path length, which is de defined by this, this integral along the position S um, over the refractive index. So that's the total optical path. If you go from point one to point two, that this one needs to be zero. And that would explain how the light actually seems to travel. So um, let me see if I can draw an example for you on this slide here. So imagine that you have a surface, an optical surface here, and we have a light source here, and we have a detector here. If we now want to know where would we see, if we look basically in, in this direction from this side here, where we, would we see that light source? How can we work that out? Well, we could, for example, put the knowledge in that in a homogeneous medium, let's say this is one medium N1, and this is another medium N2, and in a homogeneous medium, it would travel on a straight line. And so that means we, we really just need to look at all the different paths that would be connected by straight lines. And so for example, one such different path would go from here to here. We could also draw another path, maybe this way, or we could make another path this way The question is, which path does the light take? And of course, the answer it is it would take the one that, that minimizes this sort of integral here. And uh, that means that we have to calculate um, the distance here to a particular point here. So that would be distance as one and the distance as two. And we would have to calculate the optical path by, by looking at refractive one, index one times S1, plus the refractive index N2 plus a, a times S2. So this is the optical path in medium one and the optical path in medium two. We add them together. That is often indicated as optical path difference. So this optical path as a sum, we would then want to minimize. So it takes, the, the light takes basically the shortest path when we add the two together. And actually, um, this is an, an analogous to a situation uh, that works like this. So imagine you are here and you want to get to this position. Why? Because let's say this here, N1 is uh, the beach and N2 is the water and you want to rescue a swimmer there. So the question is, what do you do? Do you run 
straight to the shoreline and then swim the rest, but that would have the advantage, uh, the disadvantage that you would have to swim quite a lot and you can run a lot faster. So you could also, for example, run to some point somewhere here so that the distance to swimming is the shortest. But then, of course, the question is, what is the best to do? And the, the best is also to minimize the optical path because that takes the shortest time to get from here to here. So if you really go through the math and work all of this out, surprise, surprise, what you will get is actually snells. So now we are going to deal with geometric optical imaging by a few examples. So the first rule is all light rays from one object point unite in a single image point. Of course, that's only true for optics that forms images, but if you talk about lenses, that's what they're meant to do. And this is the way we work out where the image is and how big it is. So you call this point-like imaging. And the image should be geometrically similar to the object. Of course, that's also um, um, a condition so that you can uh, define that as imaging. That means a line should become a line and a plane should become a plane. So this is called Gaussian imaging if you fulfill these conditions. So here is an example, a simple example. If you work, try to work out what happens uh, in terms of ray optics when you have an object as seen here on the left side and this is image to an image position. And this in a way is the simplest case here. We have just a single optical surface that is sort of given by this surface where we go from one medium with in index n to a medium with index n prime. And you see here that we can draw certain rays that are important. One ray is the one that um, we are, let me change to a light to a pointer again. Um, so you can nicely see this point here where the light ray goes straight on the optical surface and therefore it doesn't change direction at all. And so in this case, if we have a spherical surface as indicated here, it would be the ray that goes right through the center point and this way it can continue straight. And another important ray is the one that crosses the optical axis. And in this case, we would apply Snell's law here, which would be n1 times sine one is n2 times sine two. So you, you would get this angle and work out where this image point is. And so this is a, a really important um, condition and uh, it's part of the exercises to actually work out really the mathematics. So here we have an example of a thin lens imaging, which is sort of an idealized situation that unfortunately never really happens in practice. But in this case, such a thin lens here would have a front focal point and a back focal point here and we would then put put an object somewhere and now work out where the image is and we can follow some very simple rules. The first one is that a parallel ray that hits this thin lens would then of course go through the focal, focal point. That is what a lens is supposed to do. Parallel rays become focal rays. Then the next thing is a ray that comes, seemingly comes from a focal point. That means a ray that has crossed or will cross the focal point will then become a parallel ray. So this ray two would become a parallel ray to the optic axis. And therefore we would form an image at this, uh, sorry, at this position. And there's another ray, ray three, which agrees with the same image point, is the, the ray that goes through the center of the lens that is not perturbed by the lens. So in fact, of course, if it was a thick lens, you will see that this is almost like a plane parallel surface and it will, it will, it will move the, the ray a little bit, but we neglect that effect. That's why it's called, it's called a thin lens. And we will form a perfect image at this position here. And in fact, if this was a distance of two times f, we would end up as two times f with the same magnification. In this particular example, slightly bit different, a little bit bigger than two f, and we get here a slightly uh, demagnified image. Okay, so these are the, the, the most important three different laws of how to form images. And um, 
that's basically all you need to know. Um, what the only other thing that sometimes is needed is that you look that you think about what happens to parallel rays to other rays so that you can work out um, um, how to how to form images. Or if they cross at the point, you can from there on draw new rays as well. So this case would be called a real and inverted image. We had that discussion before, so you see that it is not standing upright like the original one, but it is inverted and it is real because you could put a screen there and it would form the image on the screen or in fact a camera. So let's look at that other conditions. For example, if we have our object between the focal point and the lens, let's draw the rays, parallel ray goes to focus, diagonal row keep, ray keeps going on. So you see already now they don't cross here. So the only way to make them cross would be somewhere there. And indeed we, what we need to do is we draw this dotted line as tracing back the rays and then we get this image. And this is called then a virtual image because you couldn't put a screen there. There would be no light. It would be just going this way. However, if we put our eye here, we would perceive an image being at this position there. So this is, in this case, an upright image and it's virtual because we need the dotted lines. So basically, whenever you need the dotted lines, meaning tracing back rays from where they seem to be coming, then this is a virtual image. So let's look at other lenses that are not convex but concave lenses. So this is a biconcave lens, which means it has two concave surfaces. And for example, we have an object that would be further away than the, the front focal point. And now you have to imagine that this ray um, will continue this way. Why? Sorry, because, because it now we've inverted the focal point. So rather than trying to draw through here, we have to now say, well, the con it will basically bend the, the, the light in the other direction. It will seem as it comes from this focal point. So you can draw a dotted line from here and that would that that is how you construct this ray. Um, the rule for the straight rays in the, through the middle always applies and if 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 I go um, so so if you if you then look what you have you have this exit ray and this exit ray if we trace the rays back you see now that we get a virtual image and it's inside so it's it and it's upright and demagnified. So it's a virtual upright image in the case of um, uh, biconcave. So if we put our object closer than the focal distance, let's work out what happens there. We have this ray again, parallel ray seems to be coming from the point F and the diagonal ray goes straight through. And again, if we connect the two rays, we get also a virtual upright image inside. And this way you can you can then work out what really happens. And there's of course converging lenses that work like this, and you have um, the convex lenses and the concave lenses that are diverging lenses. Um, so here you see sort of an animation what happens. So you see that we go from a real image in this case to a virtual image this way. And at the focal point we have um, well, neither a real nor a virtual image because both the rays don't cross, but we have an image at infinity. That, that's why I would call that a virtual image at infinity. If you placed your eye here, you would still be able nicely to see that image actually. And that's how most of the systems actually work. You focus to infinity when you observe your, your image with, with the eye. And here you have a similar diagram what happens um, for diverging lenses. And you see in this case, we really just have a virtual image where the magnification changes a little bit. Our next experiment is actually whiteboard optics, which is a nice way to show you directly what happens to the light rays by some sort of laser pointers. 